Thank you very much for um, the introduction and thanks a lot Thomas and DLU for the kind invitation and for the perfect organization of this workshop. We're glad to be here. I will talk about quantum criticality in frustrated magnets and in particular um, quantum phase transitions involving spin liquid phases and call this kind of uh, fractionalized quantum critical points because the emergent excitations that govern the one or both of the adjacent phases of these transitions go are governed by fractionalized or are fractionalized excitations. Um, <clears throat> the majority of the calculations um, that I'll be presenting here uh, were actually done by, um, for the first part, by, by Urban Seifert, who was a postdoc in Dresden and is now in Santa Barbara. And uh, for the second part, uh, Si Hong Liu, who is a joint postdoc of uh, both Fakias Assad's group in Würzburg and my group in Dresden uh, within this uh, uh, yeah, joint uh, research cluster CTQMAT uh, Würzburg Dresden research uh, initiative. So uh, this is the outline of the talk. I will start by reviewing um, the concept of fractionalized quantum criticality in contrast to conventional quantum criticality. And then, then I'll introduce a generalization of the Kitai spin one half model. And we've seen this generalization actually already in two of the talks uh, in this session, um, in one of the talks this morning by Piers Cohn. Uh, I call this uh, kind of uh, Kitaev spin orbital kind of models. This has been termed Yao Li model uh, in, in this morning's talk, or you can also think of this as kind, kind of Kitaev cool Kompsky model. And I will argue why this kind of Kitaev spin orbital model is actually very much appropriate to look for kind of these fractionalized quantum phase transitions, because in these kind of models, we can really make specific statements that are controlled, fully controlled analytically, or we can even do uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations without any sign problem, although it describes a frustrated magnet. And that is basically what I will be showing in the third part that uh, we do have a model where, uh, where we believe have, uh, have strong evidence for a um, fractionalized quantum critical point, which is governed by fractionalized fermionic degrees of freedom. And then I'll conclude. So, um, Oops. Uh, anyway, uh, what do I mean with fractionalized quantum criticality? Well, when we think of quantum criticality, we often introduce it in a way as just a classical version of a, uh, oh, sorry, as a, as a zero temperature version of a classical quantum critical point. Um, and, and a beautiful example uh, is kind of a transverse field easing model, more or less maybe uh, 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 realized in this Kobanayo bait. Uh, um, uh, kind of easing chain. Um, if you put that into a magnetic field, then you, you, you get a transition and this transition um, is described within the one plus one dimensional easing universality class. And uh, you can uh, write down a critical exponents for that. And, and everything appears to be well understood at least in the vicinity of this quantum critical point. The point of this talk um, is that the quantum critical point is actually much more than just a zero temperature version of its classical counterpart. Many instances, there can be new physics that merges at such a, uh, uh, at such a quantum critical point that, not, that cannot be understood within this usual quantum to classical mapping. And um, this statement actually becomes very prominent in frustrated magnets. And a uh, very well known example for that is the deconfined quantum critical point. Uh, that has been suggested uh, between a nil antiferromagnet and a valence bond solid. And uh, maybe many of you know that uh, within this usual Landau paradigm that works so beautifully well for the classical phase transitions, this transition between two symmetry broken phases with symmetries that are distinct um, is either through some intermediate phase or, uh, uh, or without any fine tuning uh, um, is, is first order. But it has been argued that due to some, some interplay between order parameter fluctuations and uh, um, topological defects, there can actually be new degrees of freedom, emergent fractionalized degrees of freedom playing a role right at the transition. And then without any fine tuning, one can have an unconventional quantum critical point between two completely conventional phases. And this unconventional quantum critical point is governed by new unconventional degrees of freedom, fractionalized degrees of freedom. 
And similar unconventional quantum critical points can also occur if not all, if, if one of the whole adjacent phase is, is governed by fractionalized degrees of freedom. So, uh, for example, a quantum spin liquid and a frustrated magnet or some other topologically ordered phase. So, if you have such a transition between some ordered states, say some usual nail antiferromagnet, and a quantum spin liquid, then this quantum spin liquid is uh, described by fractionalized excitations, interact by an emergent gauge field. And if, uh, if these uh, fractionalized degrees of freedom play a critical role at the transition, for example, if they become gapless, um, or if they're gapless throughout the phase, then uh, this will drive this transition unconventional because they play a critical role at this transition. And a similar such uh, physics can also not only occur between, between ordered states and quantum liquids, but also between two different kinds of quantum spin liquids where, where maybe one of the quantum spin liquid uh, is described by a different gauge field uh, or is described uh, by a symmetry breaking. So this would be a symmetry broken quantum spin liquid, for example. The goal of this talk is to present a transition bet between or in and out of such a spin liquid phase in a microscopic model in the controlled setting. And I will argue that this is possible in a spin orbital generalization of the Kitaev spin one half model. So before I'll go to the generalization, let me go back very quick, quickly to the spin one half Kitaev model, just because it's so beautiful. I, I imagine that all of you have seen that before, and I, I, uh, I believe that uh, Natasha has talked about that on, on Tuesday as well. But uh, just to set the stage again. So Kitaev spin one half model. Is, is a model on a honeycomb lattice of localized spins one half that interact just by easing degrees of freedom. And the local quantization axis changes now as a function of, of, of the, uh, the color of these bonds. So the three different kinds of colors corresponding to X, Y, and Z links uh, and, 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 and X, Y, and Z quantization axis. This is a highly frustrating model, a highly uh, uh, degenerate classical ground state, uh, but uh, the, the quant even the quantum case, uh, spin one half case, can be solved exactly via Majorana representation. And the idea is that uh, you replace uh, these uh, Pauli spin one half operators by uh, Majorana operators, Bx, By, Bz, and the fourth one, C. So instead of having now uh, uh, three Pauli matrices, we have four Majorana operators, and then you need an additional gauge constraint. And with this gauge constraint, actually, um, I don't know, somehow, oops, something's not working really nice here. Let me see. Okay. Oh. Sorry for that. Okay. So basically, uh, you plug you plug this representation. You can show that actually, the, uh, with, with a gauge constraint, this representation fully satisfies the SU2 algebra. So this is a faithful representation, and uh, then you plug this into the Hamiltonian, and then you of course initially end up with four Majoran operators because you started with bilinears and sigmas, uh, and each sigma has uh, has two Majoran operators. But then actually, what you what you can show is that these B operators you can combine into linked variables. And these linked variables commute among themselves and with the Hamilton. And that's the crux, uh, the, the, the crucial point of, of, of this solution that you have a, uh, 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 this large, uh, I mean, a thermodynamic number of conserved quantities, these UIJ operators that commute with the Hamilton and add among themselves. And that's why you, you can simultaneously diagonalize these U's with the Hamiltonian. And, and basically these, these U's can be understood as a Z2 gauge field because they square to one, uh, because the, the Majorana operators square to one and these are emission operators. I mean, uh, these are emission operators, these U's square to one. So they have eigenvalues plus or minus one. That, that's why they correspond to Z2 gauge field. It's a static Z2 gauge field because there are no fluctuations allowed because of this commutation, right? In principle, of course, you could ask, well, now uh, you could just add some other perturbations to this model. And that's, of course, what people have done. 
Um, for example, adding some Heisenberg uh, uh, coupling, that's also something that would be maybe uh, um, required if you would like to model some real materials such as ruthenium trichloride or some iridates. Um, um, the point is, um, you can of course do some um, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, numerical simulations on small clusters, such as this one on, on 40 site, uh, a 24 site exact diagonalization, and you can uh, map out the phase diagram, but there's no chance to say anything about the transitions. It's basically the, the clusters are just too, slow, uh, too, too small. You, of course, you can do DMRG and then you can go to uh, slightly larger uh, uh, lattice sizes, but there's no chance to do anything, uh, to say anything on the nature of these transitions because then you would really would like to do some finite size scaling and it's practically impossible. You can also do not any uh, analytical approach because whatever you, you basically would like to do, I mean, you can do some kind of part on mean field theory, but then you basically neglect the fluctuations of the gauge field, which is not allowed except at the Kitai points. But once you go away a little bit from these Kitai points, then you introduce fluctuations of the gauge field and then nobody really knows what's happening with this gauge. It's extremely hard to, to put this uh, kind of uh, in a controlled analytical, analytical computation. You, can also do not any, you cannot do any quantum Monte Carlo simulations because of this dynamical Z gauge field. So uh, basically there's no sign problem free quantum Monte Carlo uh, available once you go away from this, uh, from this GTIF limit. So basically, although at, in, in this particular model, there may be a possibility of a fraternalized quantum critical point. We can't, cannot extract it, at least not theoretically. So that's why I propose to go to a spin orbital generalization. And the, the way we think about it is, uh, of course, there are many generalizations of polymatrices, but one possible generalization is to think of a polymatrix as a representation of the Clifford algebra. And then you can go to higher dimensional representations of Clifford algebra. So for example, instead of having two by two gamma matrices, you can have four by four gamma matrices. You can even go further like eight by eight or 16 by 16 gamma matrices. And in, in fact, in this way, you can realize in a microscopic model, all 16 types of topological superconductors that, that have, been, uh, have been discussed in, in, in a fifth theory language, uh, Nikitaev papers and others. Um, in the simplest realization, actually, uh, with this just uh, these, these gamma matrices, you can um, you can you can uh, you can actually show that the, the, these four by four gamma matrices can be written in precisely the same way that we have seen also this morning. I mean, we we call this the kind of Kitaev-Smith orbital model, but you can also actually show that this is fully equivalent to the Yao Li model. And in fact. As, as we have also heard this morning, um, with, within a Majorana representation, and I've written on a particular one here, it doesn't really matter which one, but um, within a particular representation, uh, you can solve this model in precisely the same way that the Kitaev spin one half model was solved. The only difference now is that instead of having just one itinerant Majorana C, you now have three different Majoranas, and I call this CX, CY, and CZ. That's the only difference so far at this point. Again, you have these B Majoranas that can be, uh, uh, again, put into, uh, into the bond operators, and that uh, make, 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 these, make these U operators, and these U operators, again, commute among themselves and commute with Hamiltonian, squared to plus or minus one, uh, so, sorry, squared to one, so have eigenvalues plus or minus one, they correspond to a z static Z2 gauge field. Can it simultaneously diagonalize with a Hamiltonian? So it's, it's really the same, uh, same type of logic as in the Kitaev spin on half model. And in precisely the same way, you can even go on and, uh, and, and construct high dimensional representations if you like. The crucial difference now to the spin one half model is that you can have further degrees of freedom to play with that you can use to show that you do have a fractionalized quantum transition to some other interesting phase. And that's what I'm going to show in the last part. So here I'll add some kind of Heisenberg type of interaction 
that only acts in the spin channel. So I call this spin orbital model because it's kind of spin spin interaction is kind of SU2 invariant, and the orbital interaction has this Kitai kind, kind of character that uh, is kind of easing easing uh, type of interaction with with this uh, with this bond dependent uh, um, quantization axis. But you can add this kind of Heisenberg interaction. Um, that of course is, has the same symmetries, and so in any uh, real system, it, it will definitely be there. Of course, in any real system, there will also be many other couplings there. But just as a toy model, the crucial point is you can use the very same representation of these poly matrices in terms of Majorana, uh, Majorana operators and can rewrite this in terms of just C operators. So there are no Bs. Uh, and, and therefore also no use involved anymore here. And that means that this perturbation now still has the property that these U operators commute with the Hamiltonian. So you now have some kind of Kitai Heisenberg spin orbital model that still has the property that, le that for all J's and K's, the, the gauge fields remain static. And that's a crucial step. That's something that was not possible before in the spin one half model, because there everything that can add will immediate, would immediately lead to fluctuations of the gauge field. Here you do have a Kitai Heisenberg model where the gauge field remains static all throughout uh, for all values of K and J. So, what would kind of a phase diagram would you expect for this kind of model? Well, you can you can look look at at this term. This term is no, of course, no longer it's no longer exactly solved because because it's an interacting term of the, of the Majorana uh, of, of of the Majorana uh, fermions, but there are no fluctuations of the gauge field. So you would expect at large J that mean field theory should be should be uh, uh, should be conclusive. Um, so what what kind of phase would you expect in mean field theory if this term becomes dominant? Then you would expect that uh, this this uh, this operator here gets a vacuum expectation value. That's at least one uh, possible uh, possible expectation. So if that happens to be really the case, you can think of this as kind of a spin density uh, uh, wave, um, because this L operator is actually actually have spin one matrices. So the re representation of the uh, 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 representation of of the SU2 alpha with spin one. Which means that they are th these are three by three matrices with an eigenvalue zero and plus and minus one. Which means that if this operator really gets a vacuum expectation value, not all fermions are gapped out, but one fermion still remains gapless. So these are kind of these, these small insets here. So for, for, because this is kind of a type spin orbit liquid phase, you have uh, three types of itinerant Majoranas, you have kind of three types of these Majorana cones. Uh, but then across maybe some or more transitions, you, you would expect some state where in the spin sector, you would expect sp some spin order, some antiferromagnetic spin order. But uh, this is still a deconfined phase described by Majorana fermions, where only two out of three Majorana fermions are gapped out, and one rain remains fully gapped. So that's what you would expect from mean field theory for that. And in fact, that is also what, what one can show in, in, in IDMRG calculations. So um, first of all, uh, lo lo look at this plot, look at, at, at the blue curve. This blue curve is really dull. This shows nothing. And this is what it's supposed to show. Because what does it show? It shows the, uh, the expectation value of the plaquette operator. Thank you. And, and the expectation value of the plaquette operator always remains one. So this is consistent with what we said earlier. The, the, the gauge field remains static all throughout. And we're always in the zero flux phase, as in the Kitai model, even for finite J. There are no fluctuations of the gauge field. And then you see that's, that's the uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, expectation value of the spin operator. And you can think of this as, as some antiferromagnetic order parameter. And that develops a finite expectation value beyond a certain finite threshold. Of course, these are on small cylinders, so we cannot really make any finite size analysis here. We cannot get uh, say anything on on uh, on 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 the um, uh, on the um, 
uh, critical behavior, but we can um, say something on a phase diagram. And the phase diagram is, it says that kind of there will be a direct transition from this ketive spin orbital liquid phase to this uh, SO3 ketive liquid phase, where we have SO3, SO3 symmetry breaking. We can even use a gradient expansion because now the gauge field remains static and gapped throughout the phase uh, diagram. And we can, uh, and so that means the only critical degrees of freedom are just the fermions. And we use gradient expansion to even show, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to predict the field theory for this transition. And it turns out, of course, uh, that that will be some kind of gloss neville dirac uh, uh, field theory uh, with some unusual bilinear that couples to, to the other parameter. And we call this gloss neville SO3. And we have even used um, uh, some uh, field theory analysis to, to show um, what critical exponents for this field theory would be. But the crucial thing that I would show, would like to show you now in the last four minutes or so, is that we can even do quantum Monte Carlo simulations because the gauge field remains static and gapped. So now we derive a model that only uh, includes these effective degrees of freedom that are relevant for the low energy transition. So we completely throw away the gauge field because it's, it's static and gapped. So for the transition, for the transition and its critical behavior, don't play any role. And we extend the model a little bit because of some technical issues to avoid some side problem. Um, we, we, we use a, we use a bilayer model, and we also use a complex terms. This basically does not change much of the transition. In, instead, of, I mean, it it, it it quadruples the numbers of degrees of freedom, but it's in the same class of gross neveu type of gross neveu SO3 transition. The order parameter is still a gross neveu SO3 transition. Here's the phase diagram that basically Si Hong got. And, and basically, I mean, these are QMC structure factors um, for different system sizes as a function of J, this, this, this interaction. Um, and, and, and basically what you, what you see here, that there are two different types of structure factors. The first one that, 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 that develops here is the C dagger LC, that's the SO3 order parameter, structure factor for SO3 order. So there is indeed a transition uh, around 0 0.5 here um, between uh, uh, the, 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 the semi-metallic phase and this SO3 phase. But there's a second transition where basically this C dagger C1, 2, which couples the two different layers, gets a vacuum expectation values. And we call this an interlayer uh, coherence that breaks a different symmetry, it breaks a U1 symmetry. And come back to that later. But let's look at the phases first. Um, so the first is, of course, the symmetric semi-metal phase. Then there's a transition uh, to something that we believe from, from the mean field theory should be, uh, should be an SO3 semi-metal, and I'll show evidence for that later. And then there's this U1 gapped phase, it's fully gapped phase. To show evidence for that, that this is really the case, here I'll show the Fermi structural function uh, indeed, of course, in this uh, for the three different values of J within the th uh, three phases. For small J, we indeed see this uh, Dirac cones at the K points. Then uh, for increasing J, you see that near the, near, near the K points, some of the spectral weight is lifted, but not all. And then for even further increasing J, there is basically no spectral weight. This is a fully gapped phase. Now let's look again at, at the spectral weight here in the vicinity of the K point at low omega. Uh, now in, 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 the, in the low J phase, in the semi-metallic phase, this, uh, this quasi-particle weight actually, if you extrapolate it to uh, the thermodynamic limit to large J, uh, to large L, sorry, then you get in our unit six, which corresponds basically to the numbers of degrees of freedom, uh, uh, so the six Dirac-Counts. But now in this intermediate phase, if you look at the same quantity, if you extrapolate it to the thermodynamic limit, this is not inconsistent. Actually, it's fairly consistent with the value of two, which is precisely one third of, of what, what we had in the, in the semi-metallic phase. This is so this is really consistent that this, in this SO3 semi-metallic phase, there's only one, there's one third of the, of the thermodynamic degrees of freedom remaining gapless, while two thirds are gapped. However, I've shown you that there's yet another interesting transition. And if I have one more minute, okay. 
uh, then let me show you just the evidence for that. Um, uh, this, well, basically what, you, what, what I can show is by, by looking at, uh, what, uh, at correlation ratios is that um, we can extract the correlation ratios for the two order parameters as a function of system sizes and go to the thermodynamic limit. And what we find is basically that the critical value of J where the SO3 order breaks down up to numerical, uh, up to our numerical uncertainty is precisely the critical value where the U1 order develops. So if this is really remains true, uh, um, uh, then this would be the first instance of a metallic deconfined quantum critical point. Remember, these are two fully independent uh, uh, um, uh, asymmetries that break at these two transitions, right? So these are two symmetry breaking transitions. And so this would be a, met a deconfined quantum, quantum critical point with metallic degrees of freedom. So let me conclude. I've presented you a, a Kitaev Heisenberg kind of spin orbital model, which shows a, a, a fractionalized quantum critical point in the so called Gaussian view SO3 star uh, universality class. And I've also shown you a lattice model that is amenable to sign probability quantum Monte Carlo simulations that not, not only has this transition in the Gaussian view SO3 universality class, but also a second transition, which could be, uh, um, uh, or at least numerical evidence uh, is consistent with an interpretation of being a continuous transition between two different symmetry broken phases and a metallic degree of freedom. So this would be a metallic deconfined quantum critical point. Thank you very much for your attention.